Today's speaker um, is Dennis McBride. He's spoken with us before, and we're glad he can uh, make it back with us today. Today he's going to talk about best available science. Um, Mr. McBride is, a, is an evolutionary psychologist with an extensive background in the science of human evolution. Uh, prior to best available science, he co-authored Quantifying Human Information Processing as an active adjunct uh, facility, uh, faculty member at Georgetown University's Medical School and Public Policy Institute. He's, he has also held appointments as professor in colleges of engineering, arts, and sciences. Dr. McBride? I, I want to thank the, um, the Skeptic Society and the National Science Foundation for the opportunity to talk. It's very much appreciated. For the past eight years, I was president of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, and I'm now President Emeritus, and I'm, uh, this is next door without going out of doors. You're at the Potomac Institute. Um, <clears throat> and I'm now, <clears throat> excuse me, Chief Science Officer for Quantum Leap Innovations, in addition to my duties at Potomac Institute Think Tank. So I'd like to do a couple of things first uh, um, with regard to attribution. The talk I'm going to give today is really an uh, interrogative and not declarative and certainly not imperative. It's, I'm asking you for help. Uh, what we face as scientists is <clears throat> a challenge when it comes to um, advising policymakers, sometimes through journalism, sometimes directly. And so what we've struggled with over the past several years is how could we portray science the best way possible so that the best policy decisions could be made? So the most important word in the title is the second, available. What does that mean? Best, we can all kind of understand, right? And we'll get to that. But available means exposure. It's all there. The data are there for you. The model is there. The coefficients are there. Everything is objective and not subjective. And the most important thing we can do as scientists is to make the best science available. And in terms of <clears throat> attribution, the first author here is Alan Mogisi, deserves all the credit. <clears throat> He's the driver here. And so what I'm, what I'm going to represent in my talk is um, <clears throat> the result of his very hard work, as well as the very last name on the list and his inspiration, Michael Swetnam. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be where we are today with respect to my talk today. So let's do a quick exercise. <clears throat> I notice um, our logo here says, that's nice, prove it. What does prove it mean? Does it mean confirm something? No, it means test it. Aberdeen Proving Grounds is all about testing, not confirming what we think normally is proving. <clears throat> and so we're going to use this as a theme today. Um, <clears throat> second, in terms of attribution, um, I have to uh, acknowledge in, uh, my appreciation to, uh, for uh, Brittany Whittington, uh, Jenna Andrews, Carly McMaster, and Beatrice Capistani for their, their work in helping put together the presentation for today. Here's the major exercise. We're going to get into global climate change eventually as a, as a case study, okay, objectively. But <clears throat> for now, I want to start with a, a little reality. If you took every human being in the world, every human being in the world, and you parked them next to each other in one foot by one foot squares, what landmass would you need? What landmass would you need? I, and I don't need engineers quickly doing things in their heads. I want what your feeling is. What do you think? Boston Mall? Probably more than that, right? Montana. Montana. It's a great start. Next. Next guess. Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Okay. One more. Australia. Australia. Great. Well, the answer is not all of Fairfax County. In fact, you could put uh, everyone in Fairfax County, one foot by one foot, and you're only using four-sevenths of the county. You could put another three billion people in Fairfax County. All right, so what's my point? I think we as human beings are very, we have egos. And my PhD is in, in neuroscience, so I think in terms of psychological thinking and that sort of thing, and that will come out in my talk. But because of our egos, we project out um, the things that we feel guilty about, the things that we feel about. 
<clears throat> and that sometimes affects our thinking. And my point today is we need to not do that when we think scientifically. We need to be skeptical to the bitter end. <clears throat> okay. My talk will include eight sections today. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of background introduction to best available science, the sources of scientific information, a proposed taxonomy that we want and need your help with, a little bit about philosophy of science. Um, we'll, we'll treat the product of science, which is models. We develop notions or models, some more or less mathematical models. Um, and, and how to use those best. I'm going to talk a little bit about best available information, which is different than best available science, <clears throat> a little bit about ethics and the case study that I, I mentioned before in terms of um, global climate change. So, if, so to begin with, I'm going to throw something at you um, that, again, is going to tie us back to the very end of the talk, the case study. We're treated to the notion that there is a solar constant, all right? And to a scientist, a constant means something, right? It means Boyle's Law. It means G. It means F equals MA. It means constant. The sun is not constant in its output. Um, we're, we understand that it's roughly uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 17th watts for any hemisphere looking towards the sun at a, a given time so we can translate joules and, and time. Um, but there's variation in the output of the sun, but maybe 7% plus or minus. So Put that in your hats, and we're going to come back to it to the degree that it's important for the rest of the talk. So my first chart here uh, poses the question, how is a person with relatively little or no scientific knowledge to judge the validity of information provided under the guise of science? I understand that you, as an audience, um, do not fit that category. You're, you're not with little or no scientific understanding. But that's why you're special for me. I, I, we need feedback. Are we getting it right with the way we're trying to explain, taxonomize, um, and uh, understand science when we deal with policy uh, makers? So I'm going to begin with a success story that a lot of people don't know about. And that is when you think of the three major branches of government, it's the judicial that, that really um, has, has got it right, I think. Originally, a fry standard in the judicial system was a threshold that said, if you're going to introduce scientific evidence into the courtroom, you need to pass a test. And typically a Fry standard would say, does the American Physics Society generally agree with this claim that's going to be made, right? So that was a start. What has, has been slowly replacing the Fry standard is the Dalbert standard, based on the case of Dalbert versus Dow Pharmaceutical. And this changed Rule 702 of, of the um, um, evidence <clears throat> laws within uh, the federal courts. And I think now roughly half of the states have adopted a Dalbert standard. Dalbert introduces three things. Number one, it says the judge is a gatekeeper. So prior to the trial, the judge is going to listen to two things about scientific evidence presented in the court. The first is the relevance. Uh, is, does astronomy really matter? <clears throat> Probably not. Number two, reliability. How reliable is the evidence and how relevant is it to this particular case? The gatekeeper then will make the decision to allow the evidence into the trial and either the gatekeeper then becomes the judge herself or the jury becomes the judge. 